uh, but mainly uh, joint work with uh, and let me just for 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 beginning, let me uh, state the result, and then I'll try to explain the uh, the notions. So the result is the following: that S in Pm over C over complex numbers. Uh, be a um, linearly normal K3 surface and the uh, distribution of zeros in the Betty table Depends on the geometry of hyperplane sections. Okay, so um, there are several things I have to explain. So uh, the main thing which comes here is in the uh, Betty table. What is the Betty table? It's not the Betty numbers in the topological sense. It's in another algebraic sense. And uh, this Betty table depends on the invariant. So the, uh, it traces some powers. So there are some invariants of, of this, this particular embedding. And uh, of course, I will have to explain how does it depend on the, on the geometry of uh, hyperplane sections. Uh, so please let me allow to start with this this um, this part. Because that's a very general a very general notion. So what's all about? We, well, we work with the following objects. So X uh, projective Variety. It can be over any field, but my my uh, my uh, favorite example is over complex numbers. And as such, so when I mention projective variety, it means that it admits an embedding into a projective space. So now there are two different ways of seeing this or introducing these varieties. There is one intrinsic way, like I see my variety here, given by some invariance, something, some properties. And I know it's projective because I know it admits an embedding into a projective space. So this is the intrinsic way of introducing our objects. Or there is another way, which is a more direct and classical way, like I give my variety in the projective space, given by uh, zeros, or uh, a system of uh, polynomial equations. So, there is this abstract way, or a, a embedded definition. So, in general, when we speak about the abstract definition, this is given by given by properties. Like fixing invariants, saying something about these objects that lie on in the variety. When we speak about the other way of introducing, we give equations. And as funny as might sound, we still don't have a complete picture of the relations between these two definitions. We understand pretty much what happens in general, but if I'm given one particular variety, either this side or the other side, 
to say how to go from one side to another is not, it's quite a tricky thing. So this is somehow the starting point of, of, of my problem. Understanding um, how to go from one side to another. And uh, the starting point of, of this theory, so that's how we, we, we get to the, uh, the so-called syzygism. And this is the theory will produce these uh, bad things. Okay, what is CCG theory? But CCG is, is a very fun word. So it appears in astro astronauts. It means when we have some celestial bodies that are aligned. Uh, in mathematics, it's pretty much the same. It would mean that some objects are, are aligned, but these objects are algebraic objects. So what is this issue? And I'm, I'm going to try to explain uh, how and how this theory appears and why is it important. So this, let me just say that the uh, this theory is strictly related to the name of David Hilbert. It's a very famous paper published in 1899 in uh, Mathematische It's a foundational paper. David, Hil David Hilbert was only 29, 1890. And yet he was able to produce two results, among other things, that slide the foundation of what uh, this. So, um, Let's start with linear algebra. What does linear algebra say? So, linear algebra deals with equations like that. M times x is zero, but m is a matrix. Say, n times n over complex numbers. And uh, what does linear algebra teach us? So, first of all, if we want to, to analyze the, uh, this uh, system of equations, we have the space of solutions. So, uh, first of all, the solutions form a vector space. That's fine. Then, uh, this vector space is generated by finitely many solutions. So we have finitely many solutions that generate the whole space. And systems that generate the, uh, the space of solutions, we have a minimum or minimum systems of generators. That's how we get the basis, the notion of the basis. And, uh, well, linear algebra or the basis theorem says that all these minimal systems must have the same cardinality. So whatever we do, we cannot change the number of uh, generators. Now let's try to do something different. So let's look again at this equation. And now let's move the elements of the matrix. So in the linear algebra case, this matrix is uh, well, the elements of this matrix are constant, are the scalars, right? Now, let's, let's pretend that they move. They, they are not scalars, but they are functions. And since we are in this uh, algebraic geometry setting, let's pretend that these functions are homogeneous polynomials in some variables. So now let's, let's consider again. <laughs> Same equation, m times x, 
consider where this time the elements of n are homogeneous polynomials in I don't know x1 up to xn. Well, if we do that, we expect that these solutions are again vectors of uh, homogeneous polynomials. So x okay. is a vector of uh, homogeneous polynomials. Okay. And now let's ask uh, the same questions. What is the structure of the space of solutions? So, structure of the space of solutions. Well, the answer is the following. So, if we consider S to be the ring of polynomials, then this, this space, so-called space of solutions, is the S module. That's how the notion of a module arises. By solving linear equations with the variable coefficients. Uh, let's ask the second question. Is it true that we, we might find finitely many solutions that generate the space of solutions? Well, the answer is yes. And this is the, uh, the basis, Hilbert basis theorem. Well, it's not taught like, like that in, in textbooks, but this is the meaning. Um, Hilbert basis theorem says that we have finitely many solutions. That generate Okay, so uh, up to here the uh, the analogy is perfect. Let's ask this the uh, the um, the last question. Let's inquire a bit about the minimum systems of generators. Do they have always the same cardinality? The answer is yes. What's the difference? That. Well, the difference is this word here. Minimal systems in, in this variable settings, minimal systems of generators do not necessarily form a basis. In, this, in the following sense. So what does a basis mean in a linear algebra? It means that we have vectors that generate the, uh, the space, but they are linearly independent. So the question I'm, I'm asking here is, is it true that a minimal system of generators uh, forms a lin so-called linearly independent system? Well, the answer is no. So this is minimal systems, systems are not necessarily free. It means that we might have for uh, such a linear system a minimal system of generators and we might have some relations uh, between these, these generators. So generators might have this is the that's how I'm the point that generators might be related by some, some non-trivial relations. So generators relating by relations. Let's consider now the module of these relations. So consider the module of these relations. These relations. 
And now we can ask again the same questions. Is it true that we might find finitely many relations that generate all the relations? The answer is yes. Again, by the theorem of this is <coughs> Is it true that these relations are free? Well, we don't know. Might be or might be not. If they are, then we are happy. We stop here. If they are not, we have to continue. Consider relations. We, it might occur that there are relations between these relations. So we might have relations between relations. And so on. We can continue indefinitely. So we consider the new relations and ask whether they are free and so on. But now question. I know that we all infinite numbers and all, but still we are in the algebraic setting, so we like more finite numbers. So is this is this procedure a finite one? I mean does this if we play this game, does it stop or not? And now uh, there's a second result of Hilbert. And it's called the Hilbert Sizzich program. So, yes, after finitely many steps, we have to stop. And that, that's how. So what we did here was to construct the so-called minimum resolution of this system of, uh, of uh, solutions for, for the uh, linear equation. So uh, minimum resolution is something which is obtained by this process, this graph here. So we start with uh, something which is an S module that's called you know, uh, <coughs> N and then we have finitely many generators that, that means that we have a, a match we have a, a very sound of something and now since we work with homogeneous polynomials we have to arrange with the degrees to be the same so uh, what, what I, I'd like to do is, it might look funny, but it, it's consistent with the, uh, the context. So let's, let's, consider, let's take this uh, ring of polynomials, take a homogeneous polynomial, and take the multiplication map. If uh, this homogeneous polynomial is of degree d, if I multiply another polynomial, that would increase the degree by d, right? But that, that would mean that on the on the gradient, on the visual gradient, this this morphism, this simple morphism, will shift to the degrees. If I want to keep the degrees, say that an element of degree d goes to an element of degree d here, then I must declare that on the left hand side, oh, sorry, left hand side, um, a, a, hom a homogeneous polynomial of degree d is actually of degree zero. So I have to shift the degrees. So that's that's the meaning here. So we have uh, the, the sum. Then I take the kernel of this map. We get another sum, and so on. But Hilbert tells us that it should stop after finite many steps, which is n plus one steps. Under one condition, at, at each step I take uh, a minimal number of generators. If not, if I add many more generators, we might, we can actually go on to forever. Okay, so that's 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 the uh, that's the uh, notion of a minimal resolution. Uh, and the Betty table keeps track. of um, the, um, how, to, how to say that, 
So it keeps track how many times one particular element here appears in the uh, in the uh, how, how many copies of one element we do here uh, we, we have here at each step. So it keeps track of the number of operations. each uh, component at each step. It might look very complicated. It's not that complicated. It's just that uh, it's, a, it's a lot of information. That's why I, I prefer not to be very precise. Just give some, some indications of how, uh, how does it uh, how does it look like. Okay, so this is a general theory. When you put S minus D, S is the ring of the polynomials. S is the ring of polynomials. The white minus D is degree minus D. Yeah, degree minus D. <laughs> so I declare that a linear polynomial in S of minus 1, in S of minus 1, constants have degree minus 1. Uh -huh. And linear polynomials have degree 0. In S of minus 2, well, uh, quadratic polynomials will be of degree zero and, uh, and so on. So there is a shift of degrees. And then all the morphisms we get here are of degree zero. We map degree zero polynomials to degree zero polynomials. <laughs> because we are in this, uh, we have to do that. Because we are in the, uh, in the projective setting. If we did it in the, in the affine case, and that game would not be necessary because the FN case doesn't care about grading, uh, degrees. It doesn't care about gradings. But in the projective space, we, we have to do that because we work always with homogeneous. Could you give a more precise definition of the embedding table? Yes. For the for the yeah, sure. Okay. So, actually, the embedding table is the following. So, I take my hand. And then I'll give an example, just to illustrate. And now I have here S of minus J. That appears how many times? S of minus J. It appears, say, KJ zero times. Or uh, right, BJ zero times. This is over every J, but I don't have any J's for So these are these are the Betty numbers, and they are in a Betty table like that. So the, on the column, uh, uh, probably it's not. Sorry, I'm confused about units. It's one, one unit. So this is the column I, and here at the, the row J. So the row is the depth, so the column is the... the yes, exactly. The, uh, yeah. okay. Here I will have the I, I plus J. Let me, give, let me give some examples. So let, let's go back to my favorite... The I, I plus J. Uh, plus J, yes, the okay. I, I plus J. Oh, okay. Because there, there is a shift each time. That's why I like to that. There is a shift. Okay. So let, let's, let's give an example. So let's consider something very simple. Ah, no, let, let me discuss first the, uh, the uh, geometric setting and then give the examples. So if x in Pn is a projective variety, it can be smooth or not. It can be reduced or not. It can be, a, 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 uh, can be anything. It can be a, a scheme that has multiple structures. Well, then we have the ideal, the homogeneous ideal of X, which is the ideal generated by all the homogeneous ideal, all the homogeneous polynomials vanishing from X. So this is an ideal with S, which was C, X, X, N. And then we try to resolve the, uh, our module will be the homogeneous coordinate 3, which is S over minus. So it's a 
just one second. So it can be any subscheme of PM. Yeah. It can be any subscheme of PM. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we care about this S module with the uh, obvious structure. And we ask about the Lady Damer or which is the same, the minimal resolution of, uh, of this thing. And that's what is the meaning of it. Does it have a, the, the geometry of X or it does have more with the embedding? So let's 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 give an example. Let's take, take three points, three existing points. Okay, so you, you take any homogeneous uh, idea in the polynomial ring? Yes. And you just take the corresponding module. Yes, exactly. My, my example would be x is p1, p2, p3. So three points. But seen in an abstract way, three points are just three points. Whatever we, we do. But if we embed these three points in, in a plane, in a projected plane, then we might have some surprises. Because the three points in a plane can, can have different positions, like they can be general position and then let's try to identify what are the so this is one two so we have our three points what are the equations of these three points well in P2 if I'm given two quadrics two quadrics will intersect in four points possibly with multiplicities so two quadrics will never cut out these three points but if we take another quadric passing to three points, then we will get precisely what we want. So the idea of X is generated by three quadrics. These three quadrics actually I can I can write them down. So I have one quadric which is a union of two lines. I intersect with another quadric which is a union of these other two lines. Well if you just take the intersection we are not in a very good shape because we have a point and this line. So if we are going to eliminate this line, we have to take a third quadrant, which is union of these two lines. And these are, for example, uh, some generic ways in the area. Okay, and... Uh, Why you say quadrics? Why not lines? Simple lines. Because lines cannot... If we intersect lines, we, two lines will intersect in only one. And if we take another point. So that's why you take the quadric and so on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If we take one more line, then we cannot. Mm -hmm. What number of quadric surfaces whose intersection is exactly mm -hmm. yeah. set theoretically this set of points? Mm -hmm. And we can, if we, if we write everything down in coordinates, we will see that these three quadrics have two linear relations. Let's try to do that. It's, it's a good exercise. So, um, if we choose P1, P2, P3 to be just the coordinate points, this is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, then these three quadrics will be x, 0, x, 1. The other one will be x, 0, x, 2. The third one would be x1, x2. Just a union of three lines. Let's call this q2, q1, and q0. What are the relations? So if we multiply q2 by x2, and this one by x1, we will get the same thing. So we get one relation which is x2, q2, minus, uh, sorry, this is q1. Is zero. Now, if we multiply this one by x1 and this one by x0, we get again the same thing. So x1, q1, minus x0, q0, this is zero. But the, uh, the other relation, if we multiply this by x2 and this one by x0, would be just we have to add these, these two relations. So actually, the third relation, which might, we might imagine, depends on these, the other two relations. 
So this means that we have two linear relations. Why two linear? Because we have here linear coefficients. So my uh, my uh, um, resolution would look like so this is S X, this is S, which is just the ocean map. Then we have three quadrates, which means that we have to shift by two because of degree two here and take three copies. And we have two linear relations, which means that we have to shift once again by one and take two copies. And this is the linear, uh, the, this is the uh, linear resolution. And then the Betty table will be the following. So we have one from this S. Then we have three. So that's more or less what is it. And now let's let's take another example. So this is one example of three points. We very nicely with the two. Let's see what happens if all three points are on the line. This, yeah, this is another situation that can occur. So now, now let's take this. Well, in the ideal, we will not have certainly in this line. So in the ideal, you see already that there is no line in the ideal here because we have no line vanishing on all three points at the time. Whereas here we do have one. And we have a cubic which is, well, you take any cubic, the cubic intersected with the line, <coughs> take any cubic passing through, for example, take again a, a cubic, which is one by the union of uh, three lines. And then we have a line, L, and the cubic, we will call it L, D. And now we have, this will generate the, the ideal. But then we have one, relation which is P times L times L times P is zero. Although it's a trivial relation but I have to, to take it into account. We could do the same here, multiply Q1, Q2 is Q1, Q2. But this depend on the other two. So here we have a better relation, whereas here it's different. Okay, and then the uh, minimal resolution would be S of X, S, then we have one copy of S of minus 1 plus one copy of S of minus 3, and then we have this relation which would be S of minus 4, which means that if we analyze the investigator here, it would be quite different. So we have 1 here, which stands for this one, then we don't have any quadrics. But we have one cubic and one relation here. So there is several formalism that needs to be needs to be uh, get used to it. But essentially, this is the this is the picture. Then we can take four points, five points, and so on. So we can play with as many points as, as we want. And what we notice is that these belly tables actually well, points are just points. But embedded in projective space, uh, one way or another, this table will um, keep track of the, uh, of the position. So this is it. Okay. Uh, so this is about Betty, Betty tables. And when I speak about distribution of zeros, it means that I take uh, my k to surface. I construct the beta table and I ask what's, on what is the distribution of zeros will depend. And the answer is it depends on the geometry of the my section. So the second part, K3 surfaces. So I know that k surfaces appear in theoretical physics. I don't know how, I'm afraid. But I know that there are strong relations because they are somehow the simplest Calabia manifolds or holomorphic symplectic or hyperkeller manifolds. So there are plenty of 
situations that occur in theoretical first physics. <coughs> but, and the, as I said, I do more projected geometry, so I'm interested in, in the equations. So what is a k surface? So S is both k3 is um, S um, as a trivial canonical bundle and H1 of S is good. Which in particular would mean that the other characteristic is, is 2. <coughs> what do you mean by trivial canonical bundle? You don't have any curve corresponding to that at one point or something? Well, it means that, if you wish, that you have a holomorphic two-form yes. that is nowhere vanishing. Uh -huh. This is the... Uh, this is the which is... Nowhere vanishing global section. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Nowhere vanishing global section. Which is, uh, what? Holomorphic symplectic. Or, uh, yeah, or, uh, well, the canonical is isomorphic to all as sheets. And um, so the, uh, this terminology was introduced by some students It appeared, it's very funny, in a, in a report, well, we all know about reports, but uh, Andre Blade actually went to Europe, the reports, to a grant. Uh, he came up with this, uh, this notion of K3, and he said that he wanted to celebrate Two things. So one is the mountain KT. So just to express the beauty of the notion, and the other one was uh, for three famous mathematicians, which was for Keller, Kuma, and the uh, Well, there are plenty of other mathematicians who. Whose names start with K, like Crowley and so on. Um, this is this is also under debate. So there's this, you know, Andre Lay was French, but he spent almost all of his life in in the, uh, in the United States because he uh, he was considered a traitor in, in France. He left the army actually during the war, so that that was an act of you know, he could not go back to France. Um, but there is, the other, the, uh, on the other hand, there is the uh, German school, which claimed that it goes back to this notion was actually due to Felix Klein, another K, famous K. So, whatever, what's the actual rule, I, I, I don't know. The thing is that we have this notion, it's very interesting from many points of view, and uh, um, it produces very nice, uh, very nice geometry. Um, we do have k surfaces. So, first example is the party. It is three. So, take any equation of the homogeneous equation of degree four that produces a smooth uh, surface. This would necessarily be a k surface. Let's take now, uh, so already you see that, so I'm giving the equation here, so the equation of the group here. In P4, let's see, take the intersection of a uh, quadric and the cubic. That's again the uh, k surface. Or take the intersection of three other x five. It's again the k surface. So these are all examples given by equations, which was on this blackboard was on the right hand side. 
Let's see another example given by something more intrinsic. So let's consider A to be an abelian surface. So if you wish the torus of dimension 2, which is projected, being an abelian surface, we naturally have an evolution which is given by the reflection with respect to the symmetry with respect to zero. So any element, x is sent to minus x. So we have an evolution. And now we take the quotient of this evolution. So a, sorry, through this evolution. Well, this thing will have some singularities because we don't have points of order two and they are uh, fixed by this evolution, one of them being the uh, zero. So we have precisely 16 points of order 2. But in algebraic geometry, we know whether when, whenever we have a, a bad object, which is singular, we can singularize. So we can uh, singularize by blowing up these uh, 16 points. And what we get here is a Hayley surface, which, which is called the Kumar surface. Kumar surface associated to the, uh, the original Hayley surface. Okay. So you mean A is an elliptic surface, then A over I has 16 uh, blow up points? A billion. A billion. Four points. Could be a little bit. Elliptic is not again. Elliptic is not? No, no, not necessarily. Depends. Can you have, you have the construction of the elliptic surface, right? A billion is an elliptic, but not the other way around. So he meets uh, the evolution. Well, we, we, we do have elliptic edge surfaces, which mm -hmm. are not the mm -hmm. uh -huh. Or you, you take the product of an elliptic curve and the curve of higher genus is mm -hmm. not a billion, mm -hmm. but it is elliptic. We should resolve a general elliptic surface. Okay, so we, we do have examples. And now uh, let's uh, try to say something about the benefits of cases. And um, I'm, I'll try to explain why is this important. So uh, maybe I'll do it now. So some observation. Some observation. I'm not going to prove it, but I've just stated it. So vanishing of uh, baby numbers. Baby numbers are just random uh, baby numbers, sorry. Not to confuse each other with baby numbers. So vanishing of great baby numbers is an open. What does it mean? So whenever you take a family of polarized varieties or embedded varieties, you take one degree, um, B, I, J, and you ask, some of them will have, for I and J fixed, will have the B, I, J zero, some will not have. Well, the meaning of, of, of this fact is that those that don't have zero B, I, J form a risky closed substance. And actually it's more than that. We can, on the so-called bad nose, we can give a skin structure. So somehow the non-vanishing, non-vanishing will give a subspace in our So, for instance, if you take the modular space of curves, or the Tachyon space, if you wish, and you, you choose some, some embeddings, some, some God-given embeddings, like canonical embeddings or whatever, and then those curves, which don't have some particular value number zero, will form a 
subtitle of the module space. And it's very, I mean, having naturally defined subschemes is very useful if you want to analyze the geometry of, of some spaces. So that's somehow using this kind of techniques, uh, Gabi Farkash was able to disprove uh, a very famous conjecture, which is called the slope conjecture. On MG. So the first uh, he did it with Mina Popa and then and then they extended for any G of types of I don't remember six I plus four something like that. So there are plenty of examples. Slope conjecture. This is because they were able to construct using this this techniques some subschemes that contradicted what was predicted by the slope conjecture. So, from our point of view, it's, it's very important to be able to control these things because in doing so, we will have information about the subschemes. So, in particular, data surfaces, surfaces uh, polarized. A, a, a module space. So this is a non-compact, non-compact space. So, so, so you, when you consider it's modular space, you consider only the smooth in this equation? Yeah, smooth. So, so okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. I, I, I should have mentioned this. Yeah, okay. smooth. By definition. Thanks. Okay. okay. Actually, it's a, a, it's a very hard problem. So. There are compactifications of these modular spaces uh, by using Hodge theory, but the thing is that we don't know geometrically what's the uh, limiting points. So this is a big issue, and one of the uh, main experts is Radu Laza, working in this area, by like finding geometric compactifications of uh, the modular spaces. Can you write his name? Laza. So he works on this problem, finding geometric magnifications of k uh, So Okay, okay, I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so if you can, you can do that. Uh, he has, he has some results on um, compactifications of this uh, one process. Because we are also interested in knowing what are the objects that we put in the border with, which is not some structures somewhere. We would like to say, well, it's this kind of surface, which is uh, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Because I mentioned hypertransections here, and the geometry of hypertransections, now it's time to uh, say in which sense the geometry of hypertransection is relevant for the details of Surfaces. And now I switch from surfaces to curves. So I take the simple curve. And um, associated to the both. So, so any curve will have some invariants. So the first and the most important is the genus of C. And fixing the genus, we have a modulus space, MG. Or diagonal space. If you are more from the differential geometry uh, side, you might actually want to fix the topological type and consider the variations of uh, complex structures on that. But, but here, since we are in the algebraic geometry uh, settings, G will be H1, C, which is H0, become on top. And now uh, there are other invariants telling how special these curves are in, in a module space. So imagine that this module space is a, it's like a big cheese of the dimension 3, G minus 3, and you, you want to say if you pick something from inside, whether that, that thing is special or not, if it has a different taste from the others, or it has a different taste. And then we, we do have some, some invariants. And one invariant, which 
is relevant for our problem is the Clifford index. And the Clifford index is defined as follows. So if I take the line bundle on C and I take the linear system. So please stop me if you, you need some, some more explanation about it. Uh, I can take these residuals. So here we have a bunch of, of points in this linear system. Here we have another bunch of points. We can add it up and get some points in the linear system of the economical bundle. What is there time space here? So? It's just the, uh, the product. The product There's. of the line bundles. Of Cartesian product. Cartesian product. So this is the projective space. This is another projective space. Yeah, yeah. So we have pairs of divisors. We one hand the divisors here, and on the other hand here. Okay. We can we add them up. And what happens is that if we fix a divisor in the canonical system, there are only finally many ways, possible ways of distributing these uh, points in one side and another. So what I'm saying is that this map is, is a finite on the image, right? Uh -huh. On the image. So actually the uh, co-dimension of the image is the difference of these, these dimensions. And I call this the Clifford index of L. It's the co-dimension of the image. can be computed, actually. It's related to index theorem, right? Exactly, yes. So this is, I hope I'm not wrong, so it's the degree of L minus twice the number of sections plus two. And one, so the so-called, why, why is it called different index? Because uh, this is, uh, Positive. This is Clifford's figure, but when I stated that this is finite on the image, this is the proof of Clifford. So if you look it up in Marshall's book, for example, uh, this is this is the proof that Cliff is, uh, is positive. Okay. And now, what are the relevant bundles? Well, if either this one or this one is a point, or even worse, the intercept, then that's not interesting. So we are interested in situations where this is, these are real varieties, more than ones. So we are interested in those L's that have two, prop, two conditions. Is one the dimension L bigger than one? K minus L is also bigger than one. So, in this case, we say that L contributes to the three coordinates. of C. Okay. And now, uh, well, these three coordinates will have different values. The three coordinates of the curve. Is the minimum value of all the people in the system where L is relevant in the sense and continuous. Let me uh, draw the this table, which is here this way. So the theorem says the following. So we consider C embedded in PG minus 1 by the canonical system. And let's consider the Betty table of this curve. When, when I mention it's embedded, I already throw out the, uh, the bad case, which is of hyperlytic curves. Uh, well, then the Betty table would look like the following. So we have a one which corresponds to you know, the first map. Then we will have some quadrics, linear relations between quadrics and so on. Okay. And uh, the pre-lasses of theorem says that 
here in this column, which is g minus c minus 2, so c is equal to x and c. This element here is different from 0. So it's just that. The, the statement about the non vanishing of some element in the petty table of Hamlet group. Uh, why is this canonical situation interesting? Because the Betty table is symmetric. We can actually prove that it's symmetric. So if we look at the Betty table, it will be symmetric, it will have a 1 here, g minus 2, and will be symmetric with respect to its center. So actually, if we know what happens when on this row here, we also know what happens on the other row because of the symmetry. Okay, and uh, there was a conjecture which is called Grid's conjecture, which stated that from here on, all the others are zero. So Grace conjecture is the problem, so I, I'm drawing again this table. So I get here g minus c minus 2 column, here we have g minus c minus 1 column, and Grace conjecture is that that was 0, that was 0, this was So this is Grace. Because it will tell us that the uh, the cycles which we can construct in the modular space of curves will have something to do with the this paper index. <coughs> okay, and from the point of view of minimal resolutions, the k situation is is interesting because the remark is that the path in the end is a linear. Normal K3 and C in S is a hyperplane section then well hyperplane section means that I take a hyperplane and cut S so I get actually the C is S intersected to P uh, N minus 1 So C will be in Pn minus 1. Then the many tables of C, well, this many here is actually canonical already, nothing else. And the many tables of S and C coincide. So that, that was something that was remarked by Marguerite. The many tables of S and Pn and of C to the emanation points. So knowing the zeros in the Betty table of S and knowing the zeros in the Betty table of C is the same thing. So if green conjecture was true for C, then we would have a complete picture of the distribution of the Betty table of, of this S. In particular, well, we know that it's symmetric because the Betty table of C is symmetric. And what I uh, did with uh, Gabi was to follow that Green's conjecture. Even more technical part, which is the...